Have you ever wondered how your faith in Jesus affects how you should follow people and use social media? That's what we'll talk about today. You are what you tweet, Alex too. Today we're going to continue our conversation by talking about the book, Who Are You Following? by Sadie Robertson Huff. Again, this book is about social media and how it affects our lives and what we should be doing as human beings and as Christians about social media, who we follow and who we don't follow. And we pick up the conversation talking about what does social media do to us? And it affects everything. It affects what we think about ourselves. It affects what our morals are. So this is the part where she said that we should guard our hearts so that we know exactly what it is that is trying to tempt us and trying to kick us really in one of our weak spots. You know, sometimes when you look at movies and music and social media parts, you think, well, that's not where my sin is or that's not my weakness or I'm not really enticed by anything. But I think social media, and now with AI built behind it, it's going to get so much better at finding that one thing, probably the one thing that maybe we don't even want to face. And so how can we do what Romans 12, 2 says and not conform to the world? But it says, be transformed by the renewal of our mind, by the renewal of your mind. Do not be conformed to this world. But be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. How can we keep away the things that's needling us where we don't need to be needled because that's our weakness and keep our focus on Jesus? I always give this example of bike riding. I have noticed long ago that when you're bike riding, and I like to go on these big, long trails, and there's a rut giant rut in the middle of the trail. And so I start staring at it. Don't go in the rut. Don't go in the rut. Don't go in the rut. And this concept of where you look is where you go. And by telling myself, don't go in the rut, I would tell you nine times out of 10, 95 times out of 100, I go into the rut because I'm staring at it. It's where I'm focused. And so now I started this thing where I look away from the rut. Helps a lot. I think that the sins of the world, the things that entice us, sometimes because we don't pay any attention to it and then it catches us, that idea of sin being the hidden lion that just pounces on us, or sometimes you are so worried about something that you end up following into the rut because it's all you think of. Heard about people who were addicted to porn and they're so obsessed with not looking at this, not looking at this, not looking at this. It's all their brain thinks about. The brain never gets a break from thinking about this thing they're trying not to look at. And she says on the internet, there's no shortage of things that we shouldn't be looking at. She says that one of the rules she follows for herself is that if she is on social media, She doesn't look at the Explorer page on Instagram. I assume that's where the algorithm is that shows you things it thinks you might like. But instead, she personally follows people. She only looks at the stuff that the people who she follows says. I do the same thing, particularly with Twitter. You can say, I don't want to see your algorithm. I want to see the people I follow. Not only that, I categorize people into different groups. So... If I'm feeling not particularly like looking at news that moment, I don't look at the news list. If I'm looking at faith, I'm looking at things of God, that's what I'm looking at. Maybe right before bed, it's not when I look at news because you don't want to get that stuff in your brain. And she says that when she sees someone that she shouldn't be following, she mutes them or stops following them. And that she says with Proverbs 4.23, we should watch over our hearts, meaning we should be tending to it. We always think about that image of the shepherd and the sheep and how the shepherd is always looking out for anything dangerous for the sheep. I think that's how we should treat our brains and our hearts. We should look for the hidden lion or the fence where the sheep is going to get caught up in and make sure we keep our eyeballs out for something that could potentially turn us astray 
And people think of it, I think, as this big, I'm going to divert from God. I think what it actually does is every footstep, let's say we're on a hiking trail. Again, this is a podcast about our journey. And every 10 feet, we get one degree off course. It's not very long before we're completely off course. I watched the Mythbusters once, and they tried to walk a straight line with a blindfold on. You know what? You can't do it. You think you're walking a straight line. And so then they would film him, and this was just crazy. At one point, the guy loop-de-looped while he said, I'm walking a straight line. Walking a straight line takes a great deal of looking, and it takes a lot of focus to make sure that you don't go to the left or the right and that we keep on the right path. I even noticed when I was a kid, I used to be into horror movies. And I started watching horror movies. And I realized at one point, while I was in Girl Scouts, I was starting to get afraid of the woods. These movies, even though they were ridiculous, even though I wasn't afraid at the moment, were tarnishing my brain just a little bit to make me wonder what's out there in the woods. I didn't want to be afraid of the woods. And so what I did, I turned those movies off. And I think that's where we go. We start turning off the things that make us afraid, make us question things that we shouldn't question, like Jesus, and leads us in a direction we're not really looking to go. It says a lot of times the problem with social media is we're trying to get liked. We hope that we post something and people will like it. You know, when you're starting out a podcast and you're starting out on social media, you have very few followers. I mean, heck, this podcast has barely any followers. And so you tweet something and you hope people like it and you think you're kind of clever. No one's even reading it. And then you start getting, not saying me in particular, but you start getting desperate. You start wanting to say something that'll get people's attention, get them to like you, get them to think that you're clever. And that's where we start getting into deeper trouble because we don't feel loved or appreciated or paid attention to. And so then we start doing the things that get us more attention. And maybe that's the thing that's diverting us from where God wants us to go. If we say, things that will get people's attention. Are we being loving? Are we being kind to someone else? That's the thing about social media is everybody loves to dump on other people. It's a favorite thing to do. So if we get into that stance where we are dumping on other people, we're not following God. And even if we're trying to get people to like us, think, again, we're funny or clever, have to be careful about what we say, even to the point where we could get afraid if we have a following and maybe we have a podcast and we see people walking away from the podcast or we see people unfollowing us on social media. Then we feel unloved. We feel like we don't belong. And the problem is, is this is not how love works. First John 4, 18 says, perfect love casts out fears, right? We know we're not really loved when we're experiencing more fear, when it makes us afraid. We know it's superficial. It's not true. These people who have a million followers, am I jealous? Do I wish my podcast had a million followers? Absolutely. But you know, that's not love. That's not appreciation. That's not the way that makes us strong. Being loved on a podcast, or being loved on social media, is not the part that matters. And if we start becoming afraid of losing it, that's even a worse thing because now we're worried that we're unloved and it can get to the core being of who we are. So we have to put even our followers in the right perspective. They're not necessarily our friends, our loved ones. They're not Jesus. They like the podcast. They like what you say on Twitter or Instagram or wherever it is you're posting. But that doesn't mean that they love you or have your best interest at heart. And then comes the problem of comparison. You know, social media, they always talk about the problem is, is that we compare ourselves with other people. We're always looking at where it lines up. The problem is, is that is social media actually giving us an accurate place where we should be seeing how we line up? My dad always taught me when you're trying to figure out what is up and down for real, you get a, what's called a plumb line, which means a heavy weight on a string. And that will show you from 
gravitational earth point of view what is straight up and down. If you use a ruler or a stick that is crooked itself, whatever it is you're trying to compare to will get even more crooked. And that's the problem with the social media. If we read and compare ourselves to other people, Cain and Abel, Sarah and Hagar, Saul and David, and even Rachel and Leah all used comparisons to each other and it drove them to bad places. When we compare ourselves to people, it's devastating. They talk about Leah and how she knew she wasn't the beautiful wife. And she kept saying to herself, now this time my husband will be attached to me. It's sad, you know, that Leah, after all these kids and years of marriage, never felt that she was worth anything because her constant comparison to Rachel and all the other comparisons we just talked about. So if we're comparing ourselves to places we shouldn't be doing that, we're going to just lose everything. And that was in Genesis 29, the whole comparison part. But Sadie said at the end, in Genesis 29, 35, she named her last child Judah, who was in the lineage of Jesus. This time I will praise the Lord. Sounds like she was giving up on the comparison and hoping at last her husband would love her and instead put her eyes on God. That's what we should be doing, putting our eyes on God, praising God, and using God as our comparison. God forgives. God understands. God helps us and strengthens us. Social media laughs. It disparages. It cancels. It tries to get rid of people who fall out of some sort of a line. But if we're Christians and we put our faith in things, that's where the social media can't touch us because our plumb line is Jesus. It's the thing we're always comparing against. We are meant to be forgiven. The internet's not very forgiving at all. And even Peter, at one point, started looking at John in comparison. And Jesus told him to knock it off. Stop looking at John. Jesus wants us to be with him and compare ourselves and love ourselves like Jesus loves us instead of looking at the world. The other part of it, too, is she starts bringing up the body of Christ and that we're all different. You know, there's times when in high school or places where I felt bullied or attacked, I was overweight, really overweight, and I felt terrible about it. But I had strengths, too. And it's not like many of the kids even gave me a chance. They took one look at me, and there was my chance. These thoughts that go on. But when we're part of the body, we understand we all have pluses and minuses, strengths and weaknesses are given to us by God. And that's where we can use our strengths to not only work with people in our lives, but also to protect us, but be a good influence on social media. Some people are great storytellers and other people are just endlessly cheerful, positive influence. It's where you're going to find your gift and you're going to use it to help bring people to Jesus. She gives this quote from Mr. Rogers that says, Fame is a four-letter word, like tape, or zoom, or face, or pain, or life, or love. What ultimately matters is what we do with it. Such a powerful thing. And that's where social media comes in. It's not good or bad, but it has some dangers, but it has some strengths. It can bring us down the wrong way, or, like Sadie Robertson, tell five million people about Jesus. And we have to know which direction we want to go. She says a lot of people want to be famous. They want to be a celebrity. I know I saw some survey that said, what did kids want to be when they grew up? And it was a celebrity. I wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted to be a scientist. I wanted to do all sorts of things. But famous, that was never a thought. And now kids want to be famous. It's interesting because I saw this other survey that said it thought that regular jobs, which is what 99% of everybody has, was a a sign of failure. If you had a regular office job, like I have, you could have done something amazing, you could have had celebrity or fame or been an influencer, but now you have this office job. Wow, that is such a wild way of looking at it. Fame is damaging. I was just listening to an interview with John Hamm, and he said something to the extent that he thinks he was able to survive 
what Hollywood is because he was older when he got there. So many of these kids who end up as child stars or even younger stars end up getting lost. You know, and we've seen that, and I've seen that in my life, all these child stars who just go the wrong way because fame can lead us down the wrong path too and cause anxiety and drug addiction. Being famous is not a goal. Pointing to Jesus is the goal. And making our lives turn into a giant arrow of pointing towards Jesus is the direction we should go. But it's also how we should consider what's important and what's our plumb line, what's valuable, what's important to help society and help other people. And if we think fame is what it is, because then you think, well, if I was famous, then I could do all this good in the world. Chances are it won't do any good in the world, and you'll just do destruction to yourself. Try to aim less for fame and more towards purpose, your reason for living, your talents. She says that there are some rules that helped her keep on the right track. And she says that she knows that she doesn't have to have followers to understand that she's loved and wanted because Jesus loves and wants us. She knows that we don't have to have followers to feel cared for because we know that God cares for us. And to be socially accepted, we don't have to be socially accepted on social media because we know that God accepts us for who we are. And so in the end, if we follow our purpose, if we follow what it is we're put on this earth to do, that's what's going to keep our head on straight instead of trying to attain more viewers, more followers, more podcast listeners, whatever it is we're doing. And she says it's tempting to take the quickest path to fame. She knows. She was famous. You know, she's part of the Robinson family. They had the Duck Dynasty show for all those years. People know who she is when she goes through the airport. But she always understood what mattered the most. She always understood that despite who she was and her fame, that God understood her, knows her, and that she is loved for just who she is, and she can be confident of what God is doing through her. Instead, social media is looking at what it can do to you or who it can sell you to, and it's not looking at what's best for you. She says in the end, it's important for us to understand that not only are we being influenced, but we are also influencers all the time, not just on social media. We are leading people towards God. We're leading people away from God. We are making people feel good or bad, loved or not loved. We're taking joy in things that shouldn't matter or we shouldn't be doing. We're making people feel one way or the other. And instead, we have to remember who we are, what we're sharing, and whether or not we're being good to other people. Every day, we're influencing people. I think about that person I had on the bowling team and how she would go out and party and do things that I think her parents would be worried about. And we were all Christians. We were all in the same church. And I was a brand new Christian. Luckily, I thought that things weren't going the way that probably God would want to go. And I had the other people on the bowling team to help me see that. But I was brand new. And sometimes when I saw people in the church, people who weren't going the direction that God wanted us to go, I found it very discouraging. Again, later on, I figured out we all go places we're not supposed to go, and that's where we go to God for forgiveness. But we have to realize that regardless of what we're doing, we are influencing other people. We're moving people in directions either towards God or away from God. And instead, of trying to improve things, we're trying to cover up. We're trying to make it all look better. And so if we don't care for the people around us and the people that we're influencing, and we could cause damage to their lives. So my challenge to you is think about that plumb line with God, that straight up and down. What are you using right now in your life to measure your life? Is it someone on social media? Or is it someone in your life who maybe you compare yourself to and think about 
replacing whatever line it is with Jesus as your plumb line, that straight up and down, that true north that can guide you in the right way. What can you do to make Jesus the comparison of all things in your life? All right, everyone, thanks so much for listening. I appreciate it. Please remember to tell your friends, your Bible study, tell your people on Twitter or Mastodon about this podcast. I would love to have more people in our community and start a real vibrant discussion about faith and how we can walk in small steps together. And remember that walking down the path towards Jesus and producing good fruit starts with small steps 